Hello. Hi. Hello, Professor. Good to see you. Well, I am, as I was telling you by email, my internet connection is unfortunately somewhat unstable today. <laughs> so let, uh, let me just a second, let me pause this recording according to your wish, and I will start record later. So, Professor, we are approaching the first anniversary of war in Ukraine. And as you know, there is no a war without a war crimes. International Criminal Court, ICC, already started to investigate some of the crimes committed in Ukraine. But also, for example, uh, Mr. Frank, German uh, prosecutor general, recently, three days ago, said that uh, his office already collected hundreds of evidence of war crimes. But aside of academic community in the political circles, uh, more and more we can hear the necessity of establishing some sort of special international tribunal for the war crimes in Ukraine. Given that Russia is not former Yugoslavia or Rwanda, but major power, and uh, especially that Russia is not a member of the ICC since 2014 and the invasion and annexation of Crimea. Are you an optimist that such a court can be established? <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your question. Um, first, one issue uh, of clarification because uh, those calling for the establishment of a special court, they are, uh, what they want is special court for the prosecution of the crime of aggression, aggression, which is a different crime, is different from war crimes and crimes against humanity. And why are they calling for the establishment of a special tribunal uh, for the prosecution of the crime of aggression? Well, because the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction over the situation in Ukraine, but it cannot prosecute the crime of aggression because of certain formalities, just to keep it relatively simple. So um, the International Criminal Court can, and as a matter of fact, is investigating war crimes, war crimes and possibly uh, crimes against humanity. Having said this, and just to keep it short and simple, having said this, we need to keep in mind that next to the work of the International Criminal Court of or any potential new special court, Domestic jurisdictions, national jurisdictions do have concurrent jurisdiction over the crimes committed in Ukraine. So that is what I wanted to say first. Okay, uh, let's cl clarify one thing. Uh, crimes, crime of aggression is important because investigating and prosecuting those crimes, that crime, uh, you can go high up all the way to Kremlin theoretically, you can go all the way up in the chain of command, which ICC, according to Rome statute, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure about these Kampala amendments. Uh, I don't think that all the countries ratify that, but I, uh, ICC at this moment cannot do that. But if a uh, special court can prosecute crime of aggression, then the chain of command becomes the the essential point of this crime. Am I right? Well, um, the crime of aggression is a so-called leadership crime because it requires the perpetration of the crime by uh, persons directing or having control over the conduct leading uh, to the crime of aggression. 
such as the unlawful occupation of the territory of another state, which is the case in the Ukraine. So it is a leadership crime. So a, a low rank soldier or a low rank civilian, a civil servant, they don't have control or um, or, or, or control or direct the act of aggression as such, and therefore they cannot be prosecuted for this crime. So it, this is why it is it is called or so called a leadership crimes. Leadership crimes, a, a leadership crimes that can possibly be committed by a head of state, a prime minister, a minister of defense, and probably the head of the armed forces or, or the relevant forces, depending on the nature of the act of aggression. Uh, well, those, those civil servants, those public officials for sure could be suspects of the crime of aggression. Lower rank civil servants or military officials, well, it is not that easy to, to answer beforehand. We should really look into the circumstances of each situation to see whether they can be, uh, they can be deemed to be in the position of leadership that the elements of the crime require. Uh, you've mentioned unlawful uh, occupation. Yes. Uh, unlawful occupation in this particular case of Ukraine started in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea and parts of eastern Ukraine in Donbas region. Uh, why there were no so many voices calling for this uh, su such a tribunal then? Why only now? Well, um, the thing is, there is a, from my perspective, there is a, there is a rather important difference between both situations, because now the occupation since last, since February last year, it was carried out directly by the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Uh, what happened? in the occupation of uh, Eastern Ukraine from 2014 onwards, at least initially, it was not that clear who was really, uh, were this, were, 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 was that conduct attributable to Russia? Because I mean, it was not that clear that Russian armed forces was uh, were carrying out the military occupation. Probably that was one reason. Uh, but again, you are asking me, asking me a question which is a very valid one. It is a very interesting question. Um, but it, it, yeah, the answer might depend on, on, on might depend on my on on a, on a number of political considerations that in the end go beyond the law. So I will refrain from speculating about those politics because um, I prefer to. Uh, to focus myself on, on the legal dimension, because that is, as a law professor, I prefer to focus on what I really know, rather than on personal opinions. Yes, of course. Uh, <clears throat> uh, are you an optimist in this informing this kind of tribunal? Because even if there is, a, let's say, critical mass of countries interested in this, it's hard to imagine that it can be formed through the United Nations because of Russia in Security Council. Is there a possibility, is there a way, a path for international community to establish such a tribunal and prosecutor's office? Uh, I wouldn't say that it is impossible because, well, I mean, uh, history shows examples of many things that originally we believed they were impossible to happen. Uh, even when the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia or the tribunal for, I mean, the establishment of the International Criminal Court was considered impossible by many throughout the decades until one day it did happen. So, 
I wouldn't say that it is impossible. It's, it is going to be difficult. Yes, it is going to be very difficult. What are the possibilities? Well, you ruled out the possibility of being established by the Security Council. And of course, this is not going to happen because, um, because any, I mean, it, we all know that Russia will veto, will exercise the right of vetoing any draft resolution of the Security Council purporting to establish such a court. So, I mean, that the, 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 uh, it, it could, this tribunal, if established, it could not be established uh, the way the Yugoslavia tribunal and the Rwanda tribunals were established in the past. So that could not happen. What are the other possibilities? Well, there are possibilities in between. For example, it could be, it could be a tribunal created by treaty between uh, Ukraine and like-minded states. How many states? I don't know, but you know, that was how the Nuremberg Tribunal was established by a treaty. But okay, in that case, the London Agreement, that was the treaty establishing the Nuremberg Tribunal. It was uh, it was concluded by four states. I mean, this if if a special tribunal for the for the prosecution of the crime of aggression is to be established, it should gather a far larger number of states to become more legitimate because, I mean, if it were created by just a handful of states, I don't really think it will be very legitimate to the eyes of, to the, eyes of the public opinion. Uh, but another possibility could be um, a so-called internationalized court, that is the Ukrainian judiciary uh, with international cooperation, with adding international judges, adding a number of, it could be international prosecutors and international staff. We have examples so far, such as the extraordinary uh, chambers in the in the court of Cambodia, which is which is a Cambodian tribunal with international judges, with with um, some co international co prosecutor, well, things variations like like those ones could be envisaged. Is there a path through? United Nations General Assembly. I'm asking you this as a scholar because there are a precedent in other cases. For example, United Nations uh, Resolution United for Peace uh, was brought to an effect through General Assembly because United, State, uh, United Nations Security Council was blocked. Is there a path through General Assembly of United Nations? I don't think so, because, um, uh, you know, uh, certain resolutions of the Security Council, decisions, decisions of the Security Council are legally binding upon members of the United Nations. In contrast, resolutions of the General Assembly are not legally binding. They, are, they have the status of recommendations. So from that perspective, you cannot oblige any state to comply with a resolution of the General Assembly because they don't have legally binding effects. Is it possible for European Union, for example, to establish such a court in cooperation with Ukraine? Uh, well, in theory, it could, but then it will be just an European thing rather than, than a truly international uh, tribunal. And I don't think I am not sure about this, but I, I think those governments trying to push for the establishment of, of such a tribunal, they want to have it an international tribunal rather than a European court. Uh, because that is one of the, because that is one of the point of criticism. I mean, critics of the establishment of this tribunal, they say, well, this is this is selective justice. I mean, um, some have said with some strength uh, that the, the occupation of Iraq by, by the US in the early 2000s was also an act of aggression. So I said, why for, why under certain circumstances 
we can establish a tribunal and why uh, under certain other circumstances not. So many, I believe, many uh, who are not very actively supporting this idea of establishing a tribunal, they say, well, this is rather a European thing. Um, why we should, uh, you know, involve uh, that much uh, if in the end this can be, this could be, uh, with reason or not, you know, uh, this could be just another instance of a selective justice. I mean, whether we buy the argument or not, that is something different. But the argument is made. Uh I want to remind you once again on this German prosecutor office uh, collecting evidence, there is also universal jurisdiction for prosecuting crimes. For example, uh, Spanish Spanish prosecutor, oh, sorry, I lost his name. Uh, uh, oh, Jesus Christ, uh, arrested. Well, uh, that, it, it doesn't matter then. Yeah, it doesn't yes, matter. Uh, a Spanish uh, prosecutor. Uh, Spanish prosecutor arrested Agustino Pinochet in London for the for crimes in um, committed in Chile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you wanted to refer to uh, Judge Baltasar Garzón, who was an investigative judge and who issued an arrest warrant, and it was served against Pinochet in London. Yes, of course, states uh, have the right have the right to exercise universal jurisdiction um, over certain categories of crimes, um, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. There is some discussion as to whether the universal jurisdiction will cover aggression or not. I do believe it does, but some other will say no. Um, but yes, this is why very initially, when we started our conversation, I told you that the investigation and prosecution of the crimes committed in the territory of Ukraine, uh, if, if it is going to be uh, effective, it should be, the, I mean, the, 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 we need concurrent jurisdictions investigating and, and, and prosecuting the suspects because there, there have been so many there have been committed so many crimes and there are so many suspects that one single jurisdiction can hardly deal with all of that. So probably you will have the ICC dealing with the major uh, suspects. But then when we talk about you know big fish for the for the international courts, um the the small fry for national jurisdictions if you want uh, a, a kind of division of labor i understand uh, professor thank you very much for your time it was a great pleasure for me and our connection was stable thank you very much yes yes that is uh, a very good thing <laughs>